This episode of the Golf Guru Show is sponsored by EnviedHemp.com. That's E-N-V-E-E-D Hemp.com. I'm happy to say that Enveed has been my choice for my CBD needs for almost three years now, and I can't begin to tell you how it's improved my life. Uh, They come in three formulas, clarity, relief, and relax. I typically take a clarity drop in the morning with my coffee to get me focused and ready to go for the day. Uh, Some relief for my aches and pains or inflammation after a run or a workout. And then I do a drop of relax before I go to bed that helps me get some of the best sleep that I've had in years. And my whoop band now tells me that it's definitely helping because my recovery scores have been higher than ever. Enveed Hemp CBD come in drops, roll-ons, and gummies. So you can take it however you choose. So go to enveedhemp.com and make sure you use the guru code guru 20 for a 20% discount for life. You heard it right, 20% discount for life. CBD is a great supplement to keep you healthy and safe in these crazy times, so go get it. So let's get to today's episode. It's not what you know, it's what you can prove. You know how to cut to the core of me, Baxter. You're so wise, but like a miniature Buddha covered in hair. I want to become a guru so girls will like me. Then I will like myself. Now before we do this, let's go over the ground rules. Rule number one. No touching of the hair or face. Of course. And that's it! Now let's do this! Are you not entertained? Are you not entertained? Is this not why you are here? Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 129 of the Golf Guru Show. I am your host, Jason Sutton, Director of Instruction at the beautiful Colleton River Club in Bluffton, South Carolina, and I am the Guru. I hope everyone had a happy and safe new year, as this is the first episode of 2022. It is great to be back. Thank you for all your support over the last four seasons. I hope the show has made a positive impact on your career or your life. I give this away for free and all I ask is that you subscribe by hitting that purple button. But more importantly, share it with a friend or share it on social to spread the word. Your kind words and DMs have kept me going and you all have inspired me to do more. I have some great guests waiting in the pipeline that will be coming your way very soon. So stay tuned and feel free to look back at the past seasons if you're new to the show. I'm very excited to share with you this week's guest, Mr. Rob Stokey. You can follow him on the gram at D-A-G-O-L-F-D-O-C, the golf doc. Uh, And he's a great Instagram follow, by the way, especially for you music music lovers out there or you guitar enthusiasts. Uh, Rob is the director of instruction at the Long Cove Club on Hilton Head Island, uh, right up the road from me. Aside from being one of the best golf instructors in the country, he might be golf instruction's most interesting man, and you're going to see why after you hear this conversation, as his career has taken a lot of twists and turns and a very interesting one for sure. Uh, from his time spent juggling his music career, playing lead guitar in a rock band, and his obsession with Van Halen, to spending his youth working with legends like Jim Flick, Paul Runyon, to having dinner in Panama with Manuel Noriega every Friday night and hanging out and attending his daughter's 16th birthday, which is quite a story. And that's just the beginning, the tip of the iceberg uh, for this awesome conversation. Uh, He also spent time at Millican University Music School, where he kind of honed his craft and learned how to play guitar, and then finished up his career in college at Mississippi State PGM School, which led him to his golf instruction journey as well. So Rob invited me over to his house uh, on Hilton Head Island to record in his music studio and have a few glasses of wine and everything started flowing after that. So the next thing you know, we're two SD cards full later and over three hours of audio gold. So I broke this one up. It was a little bit too long and split it into two parts. So we've got part one coming at you, which is about an hour and a half. And then part two will drop in another couple of days to a week. So sit back and enjoy this amazing conversation with a brilliant and entertaining, my friend, Rob Stokey. Enjoy. 
So we rock and roll, rock and roll. <laughs> Did you never try to sing? <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, I, I can't sing. <laughs> Not so. a. There is one one lyric on our MFI album where I actually did spoken word but live i would jump on the mic i was always the one who did the band introductions and there's a very hidden video out there of a band in when i was 18 that i get up there and i'm like hey indicator because <laughs> yeah you have a, you have a great radio voice oh yeah you great know? face for radio right <laughs> <laughs> i think so i mean officially welcome to the show hey Ralph thanks Spokey. man yeah exciting it is exciting it's cool yeah, we've we've long time coming. It's been one of my goals. Is that I'd right? Listen to it all the time. I'd be like, dude, I want to be on there. <laughs> yeah, I've always had, always wanted to have you on, especially since you know watching all that went through with COVID, and <laughs> you know, it's like, oh my god, this guy's even more interesting. Yeah. Not that I'm a guitar player, but I mean, we'll get into it. Yeah. But just mu- being a music lover, and I'm always Sean Kennedy. Do you yeah, know Sean? Yeah, no, well, Sean was working at Country Club of the South when I was at Golf Club of Georgia, so okay. I knew him. I knew you yeah. guys had a connection. Yeah, yeah. Um, We've he, never jammed, but that guy's so good. I mean, he's yeah. He he comes. He's just so creative. Yeah. In what he does, but I mean, he's got a really pr- pretty thick like punk rock. Right, he does. Yeah, background he comes from that punk scene, and you know, we tried to get him in the quarantine guitar crew i think we reached out to him because we were like man we need a bass player too right you know? yeah so you guys need to definitely get together live and and do it we could have a good pro jam i think you so know? i think so 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 take us back man how did how did it all start because I'm, I'm so curious about not just the music thing but, yeah you know how how you get into golf so right. talk about your childhood and- so yeah i grew up in a really small town um southern illinois you know a couple thousand people um Basically, it was a lot of farm, a lot of farming, um, some factories. My dad was a judge, um, and he had played golf at Washington University in St. Louis. So my mom was a good player, and so they would take me out to play a little bit. You know, I'd ride around the cart, whatever. I think ordered me my first set of clubs when I was probably seven, and I'm left-handed. Really? Okay. Yeah, I'm left-handed. So they ordered left-handed clubs, but they came in right-handed. And I played, I played for like six months, right? And my dad's like, what are you doing on that side of the ball? I'm like, I don't know. I'm a... But I didn't really get into it. And then one day I was at the club, and, I, and our course was a, I love it. I mean, just love the place. But it's basically farmland with nine flags. Nine-hole golf course, no range. There was a chipping green that was tiny. And uh, I ran into one of my friends from school out there. And I'm like, oh, do you play golf? He goes, I'm starting. So the next day, you know, Kind of the same thing for most of us, you know. Parents dropped us off at eight. Yep. We'd go around the nine holes, eat a cheeseburger, do that. Then our dads would come out at five and we'd play a scramble. Well, we didn't have a pro. There was no pro at the course. And probably my second or third year that I was really into it, um, some people moved in to run the golf course. And they had two boys that were our age. So we had a foursome. And it was just, I mean, I'm not going to say it kept us out of trouble, it kept us out of more trouble, but I mean, <laughs> you know, we'd play it backwards in the winter and, you know, we'd race all the private carts to see whose private golf cart was the fastest and yeah. get our ass kicked for that and all that. But, um, so we all just played and what kind of kid were you? I was kind of an athletic kid. I played a lot of sports. I mean, you know, enjoyed them. You just kind of had to as a kid, you know, I mean, I'd ride my bike as a big BMX or, you know, nice. doing all that, built a BMX yeah. track in the backyard and. You know, we just, uh, so we'd play, and uh, the four of us all played. At one point in time, the f- four of us, two were golf professionals, two were superintendents. So it made an impact somehow, you know. Yeah. But um, I don't know, you know, so in high, in high school, I I played a lot of sports. I, was, I got into music very early. Got into music about fourth or fifth grade. Like, really, uh, the Beatles turned me on, and I was like, this is great. And, uh, you know, got a guitar, didn't know what I was doing. Once again... So how did that work out? Like, did you ask your parents for yeah, a, guitar? a guitar? You're like, I, th- I think guitar is going to be... Yeah, I wanted a guitar. I wanted to be cool, you know. The chicks dig so, the lead guitars, yeah, right, right? that's right. You know, I just <laughs> dress up like Kiss in the bedroom, you know. <laughs> um, got a guitar. Of course, it's right-handed. <laughs> you know, so of course. I'm like, okay, well, yeah. whatever, how do you, you know... Went and took some guitar lessons, and it, and it was hard then. You just didn't, we didn't have access to music. I mean, we didn't have a town. You could sometimes get the radio station from Evansville, Indiana. So how did, how did music, like, intertwine yeah. with golf? Yeah, so I uh, wanted a guitar. 
you know, got it um, right-handed, <laughs> didn't know how to play, you know, went to a guy, he shows me like, you know, the typical stuff, some notes and stuff like that, and how to play some chords, and that was cool, but uh, nothing that was earth-shattering, right, um, and then one of my really close friends, his sisters were older, and they were the cool kids, right? And yeah. he had moved to Oklahoma City. And uh, so he came back for the summer, and he's like, ah, oh, dude, like, check this out. Van Halen. Like, oh. oh, holy shit. Yeah, God, this is where what? it started. Like, what? Yeah. And, <laughs> you know, back then, you know, you had albums, too. So I'd get the album and just stare at the cover and look at the back and all that. And so that, that, that put me in the rock and roll thing. And so this was like early eighties. Yeah. Yeah. Probably late seventies, early eighties. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Still elementary school, mm -hmm. you know, going into middle school or junior high as we called it. And, you know, it's kind of the kid who, you know, was into that. And then it just got, got more and more. And I, you know, I'm one of these people that is, like, you're either in it or you're not. Like, I either do something and I go, I just want to do everything or I want to yeah. do nothing. The only thing that I can kind of do half-ass is bowling. Like, I, <laughs> I can bowl and have fun. Yeah. I just try to spin the ball, but I don't care if I'm good or bad. So, yeah, um, you know, continued to play golf. Uh, got Was getting better. Um, and I guess maybe 12 or 13, I felt like I was decent, but I needed something. I mean, I didn't have a range. So, I mean, I, you know, you've played the same nine holes six times every day. You're kind of getting bored. Yeah. And so my parents sent me to Golf Digest schools. Okay. And it was, this was in their heyday, their junior schools. I mean, it was like Flick, it was Todd Anderson, John Elliott, Tom Ness, um, Paul Runyon. And what a list right there. Yeah. And so I, I really got into it and continued to see Paul Runyon. And Jim Flick. I was about to say, Flick is like one of my, yeah, like sort of, I wish I would have spent some time with him. Yeah. So definitely want to unpack some of the stuff you've learned he's, from him. He's the best, man. I'll tell you, it's funny. So when I presented at the 2004 Teaching and Coaching yep, Summit. I was there. Flick presented the same day. And there's a picture somewhere, and I've got his book, and he was like, this is cool. You're my student. You're presenting on the same day as me. And I'm like, yeah, man, this is like a lifelong dream, you know? And I saw him pretty much every year until the year he died. Um, and it was awesome. Um, Runyon probably had the biggest impact on me. I am I grew up, my course was short. So mm -hmm. by the time I was 15, I mean, you'd driven every green <laughs> except for the one par five, right? So you had to be good at wedges. I mean, I'm an awful four iron player. I never did a four iron, you know? <laughs> um, but wedges, you know, so you, so you get in there and I, and Paul just... I mean, the first time I met him, I walk up and he's wearing long pants with birds on it and a long sleeve shirt with flowers on it. And I'm like, Fuck. you know, come on. And he's chipping. He's talking to this girl. He's chipping. And every ball, the cup's filled. And the balls are just rolling up, kissing it. And I'm like, oh, maybe he's got something to say. You know, I might listen to this guy. Respect. And he, uh, man, it just opened my eyes to like how, and I remember he was, he was probably so, 77, 78 when I met him, right? Wow. And he's like, Robbie, I'm hitting it farther now than I ever did. Like with new graphite shafts, I'm, I'm hitting drivers 200, 210. Like, dude, dude, you know, you were the leading money winner on tour. You got the record for the PGA Championship match play. You know, you smoke Sam Sneed, you know? And it was just cool to watch him and how creative he could be. And So and you knew who he was, like when you started? You know I, did what I'm saying? Not, I did I not. I was going to say, that's the question. Like at that time... No clue. You probably didn't know have nah. a clue like how good this guy was, no how clue. much of a legend, right? And then people started telling me. Like, yeah, you get the you, know, you get the second. The old guys are going. Do you know who you're working you're right? with? Right, <laughs> right. And you know, I I turn his book on, which is like my prized possession book. He gave me you know signed copy when I was a kid, and um, I tell people like that book's so far ahead of its time. Like it's still it's still ultimately relevant. And you know, if you look back, he invented the belly putter. He had the thing, you know, where he'd reach his putter and attach it. And mm -hmm. he was just so good. And, you know, a lot of that stuff, I mean, a lot of that stuff people don't necessarily teach, even though it's still relevant. Sure. But I'll tell you, it, it, the coolest thing, so we'd be, we'd be sitting there and he'd be like, okay, Robbie, let's do something. And take the range ball, right? The old striped range ball. And he'd set it down so the, 
the stripe is parallel to the ground. And I'd stand maybe six feet in front of him. And he'd be like, count it. And he'd hit a wedge shot. And it might spin one time. I'm like, <laughs> and to this day, I know enough about golf. I can kind of figure some stuff out. Still can't figure out. He would hit a pure knuckleball. Just It would just go up. It might turn half a rotation. That turned once, Mr. Runyon. And he said, you know, look, I grew up on sand greens in Arkansas. Played with my brothers. They were all long. I had to learn how to stop it. And somehow he created this. I mean, I mean, I think he's still using the sand wedge he had as a kid. So what do you remember technique-wise? Like, if you had to go oh, teach yeah. it to another right, yeah. golf pro, and like we are now, yep. like, what would be some of the high um, points? You know, his you putting is 45 degrees inward and upward, so you put your elbows against your side, you turn your forearms 45 degrees inward and upward, you know, so... Um, kind of Mike Shannon-esque. A little sort of Mike thing. Shannon, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, and everything's locked in. Mm -hmm. uh, he liked to play the ball off the front foot. He liked to chip with everything, four iron down. Um, but he had all these different, he had a cut pinch, um, like a cut lob, spinner, all that kind of stuff. Um, use a lot of different clubs. Um, same technique um, with the arms 45 degrees inward and upward, elbows close. And uh, that way, if your wrist flipped at all, it only flipped it square. So for, for the listeners, you're basically having sort of a... Palm open. Weak, weak grip, strong grip, opposing. Yeah, opposing. Almost like an old Corey Pavin putting grip, Well, right? Corey Pavin used... Paul's method. There you go. Okay. So yeah, that yeah. would be, um, and it, it's, it's genius. I mean, it just, you know, if you, if you do flip it, you're never closing it. Did he talk at all about body pivot or body rotation or was it more about the club? It was more about the club. He didn't yeah. talk a lot about <coughs> rotation. Um, mm -hmm. you know, I do remember like I was struggling. So in high school, I guess, um, I work on my wedges all the time. Right now we didn't have a range and I had a shag bag that had 53 balls in it. My dad would count it every time I came <laughs> home, you know, um, I could hit from the fourth fair fourth woods to the, on the left to the third fairway on the left, if nobody's playing, but I'd go to the football field summer and nobody's there. I'd park it on the goal line and, you know, 10, 20. And so I was learning the clock method, right? Nine o'clock, 10 o'clock. Mm -hmm. like, ah, nailed it. Could do it all the time. Well, then I'd be in a tournament and, uh, nine o'clock and I'd, feel it go to 10 right and then i dump it and it sucked and so i'm like <laughs> talking to paul and he goes look f that man just what's 40 miles an hour to you if your swing's 100 what's 40 i'm like i don't know this he goes hit do that okay well that went about 40 okay do it 50 ah oh, yeah there's no radar there's no nothing measuring that it. you know nothing that. but yeah but i could <clears throat> sense it yeah and from that day forward and i say this in all my clinics I've never thought about where my backswing goes. Never. And I, I'll hit shots and I'll be like, I don't know if it goes back any farther or shorter. I don't care. Don't tell me. But I know what this is my feel, you know. And it was, so it was more speed coming through and really took some pressure off me. And, uh, man, he was, I mean, he was awesome. I mean, it was just sick to watch him. Watch him sit around and hit chips and pitches and, dude, off the chain, man. Guy was the best, and he needs – he's not in enough conversations because I, yeah. I believe if you look at his stats from what stats they have, the, like his lifetime average on tour from 80 yards and in is like 1.79 shots. So he hold out more than he didn't get up and down. <laughs> I mean, or you know, I mean, it's just, you know, stupid. That's crazy. And just for the listeners, we're enjoying some really good wine yeah, S well, sitting in the, the studio. In the studio. This is, this is amazing. So I appreciate that. Yeah. Also, in high school, I'm, I'm I'm managing two things right now. I'm playing in a band, playing golf. Um, so so talk, backtrack a little bit. How does that start? Like, how does the band start? And how do you even be get good enough to play in the band? Mm, you know, like yeah. I think don't don't skip some steps here because I'm curious about like, <laughs> how do you? I mean, I look at guitar players like you. I'm watching you on Instagram, and I'm like, yeah. man, that's amazing. Like, it's just I guess it gets to where it's complete memory. Right, yeah. so much. I mean, you're not sitting there looking at a sheet of music, no. and you're sitting there riffing off these Van Halen things yeah. and Tool yeah. and all this other oh, stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm going, what the heck? Like, how how good do you have to get? And then you've played in a band, as we'll get to. Yeah. But I mean, talk talk to us about the early days. So, so yeah, I, I there was no instruction again. So it's feel, that's what blows my mind. Trying to play with the radio, right? Um, and I finally I remember uh, maybe seventh grade. Talk my dad into loan me some money so I could get a big amp. 
right? It had to be big. <laughs> you know, so I get this huge stack and it can't even fit in my room. So it's in the garage. And, you know, back then, I mean, everything was loud. Like now you can, I can set my amp up to play in bedroom level. It's no big deal. So I'd open yeah. the garage door and I'd be out there just playing this crap. And I was so bad. Yeah, I, was I mean, say, loud, but terrible. Like, <laughs> like 20 little fourth graders would ride their bike up and sit and watch. And I'm just like rocking out. And I think I'm awesome and I'm sucking so bad. God, that's so bad. So, but, <laughs> um, so there was a town next to us, like 30 miles away that had, a it was a bigger town, right? Like that's where we'd go to cruise chicks and stuff. You know? And, um, you're 13, bro. Yeah. Right. I mean, yeah, was <laughs> on early, your bike yeah, or on your my skateboard bike. Yeah, or what's yeah. going on. So, <laughs> so eventually like they had a music store. So go up there and, you know, met a couple guys and, and, Tried to start some stuff in my town and it didn't really ever. I mean, there just wasn't enough. You know, I mean, there's a legend of this guy who was like eight years older than me. Oh, you can play the Star Spangled Banner with his teeth. So that became my goal, right? <laughs> to learn to play the Star Spangled Banner with my teeth. And I used to just work on that so much, you know, because I thought that, well, that's, man, that's what they say, right? This guy can do that. I want to be that guy. Yeah. So, so that, that worked. And then, I mean, when I got into high school um, and started driving, <laughs> this, I'll tell you, this is a funny story. Here so. we go. Here we go, yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> I, uh, I'm an eighth grader, and in our town, basketball is the sport. Like, we're a basketball town, and, and, it, and it, those are the studs. <laughs> Obviously, I was not one of them. But so, like, this guy who's a junior or senior, big, just a stud, right? He's like, hey, I heard you play guitar. I'm like, okay. He's like, we're forming a band. I'm like, all right. We want you to play. All right. So they come and pick me up, and they put me in his car, and they drive to the little town next to us. And, I, and the whole time I'm in the car, I'm just thinking, they're just going to take me in the country and beat the shit out of me. Like, that's what's that's what's supposed to happen. These guys are super cool, you know, and they're just going to kick the shit out of me. <laughs> so we get to this guy's house, and I set up my little amp and everything, and I sit down. And they want to play Jesse's Girl, okay? Okay. And I sit Rick down, Springfield? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I sit down, and as soon as I touch the strings, I'm just getting electrocuted. Okay, so I stop touching them. And they're like, just play. And every time I touch this, I mean, literally, like, just like you shoved your finger in a socket. Something's wrong. <laughs> and I'm sweating so bad, and I'm so nervous, you know? I'm like, Jesus Christ, what the... And so finally, I just said, screw it. And played it, and then, you know, it gets to the middle part, and they're like, dude, play that again. I'm playing it. Oh, that's awesome. That's awesome. Well, I later found out, you know, I'm plugged in some outdoor outlet. I'm sitting <laughs> on a metal chair, right? I mean, like, it's just going right through me. And I was just like, ah, I just did. So I played Jesse's Girl, and they were like, ah, oh, this is awesome. And funny thing was, so, like, I guess maybe last year or something, I went back for, like, a decade reunion at our town, you know, mm-hmm. like the whole. And Steve... Um, the guy who was who recruited me played bass in our band. Like a bunch of high school guys got together and we played. Yeah. And so he played, and he was the one who drove me out there, and thankfully did not kick my ass. <laughs> <laughs> so what's he doing now? He's playing in a rock band. He's in a, a country okay. band. Yeah, he's in a country band. Like they're a pretty successful country band. Um, nice out of the Midwest. All right, so you get to later in your high school mm-hmm. years. High school was a unique situation. Um, I. Uh, I was playing in a band out of Effingham, the town next to us. So what do you get? Are you guys playing gigs where? Eh, parties. <laughs> parties? Right? Okay. Parties. Yeah, <laughs> backyard parties. Um, my parents hated it. I was about to say, how did the, the, I mean, the rentals take this? hated it. So I'd be sitting around all day doing nothing. And it'd be like 5 o'clock, and I'm like, hey, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to go um, band practice. And they're like, <laughs> oh, no, no. You're supposed to uh, vacuum the pool today. I'm like, you didn't tell me that. Well, you got to do it before you go. And I'm like, shit, I'm supposed to go. And you see me loading <laughs> yeah. two 412 cabinets into my Camaro. You know what I mean? <laughs> so didn't really, it didn't take off, but it was fine. You know, it was fun playing, whatever. And then um, my junior year of high school, I left and went to a military school. So, um, okay. Was, why? The, <laughs> you know, I mean, Come you know, on. There, there's there's a couple ways to look at it, right? Okay, I wasn't 
Usually we don't willingly go to a no, military yeah. school. I, I kind of I put a little bit of it out there that I wanted to. Um, yeah. But, yeah, I was not doing well in a small rural public school where I'd never experienced anything else and had, you know, done my share of things that, you know, I got in a little trouble and all this. But it wasn't a required thing. So I went and, you know, in my life, everything's been luck. <laughs> okay, there's never been anything that's been... Yeah, it's just been luck. And so I go, and in military school, everything's alphabetical. Well, they, they fucked up the... I can cuss on here. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, good. Are you kidding me, Trevino? Yeah, right, yeah, right, yeah. <laughs> so they screwed up the names of me and one other guy. Okay, so we're roommates, and this guy's from Panama. And he, the only words he knows in English are kiss lyrics. <laughs> Like, that's it. That's all he knows. I can't wait for this story. I mean, so, but he's a drummer, okay? Yeah. So I'm like, oh, hell yeah. So we got to where we could go and use the music, the, the band room, band building, and we'd go down there and jam. And he was a freaking incredible drummer and still one of my closest friends in the world. I mean, we call him Panama, and, <laughs> and he was great. And so um, that's where the band thing probably took off more okay because like all of a sudden we're going every night and playing with a drummer and then we'd get this and um so they so the timeline of my of, of everything's a little weird here but so no, no, that's all right i'm trying to keep you on track here yeah so i went <laughs> um i went and lived with him in panama for a while and, uh, and you're 16 17 yeah ish now yeah you're something like that. junior in high school yeah Okay. Yeah, I went down there. Um, family was extremely wealthy. And I don't know how much you know about the country of Panama, but like most South African or South American countries are Catholic. Um, the wealthy in Panama are Jewish. He was Jewish. So um, we went down there and lived in beautiful high rise with his mom. And she's buying us cars and we're rocking out and just all this. And every Friday night we'd have dinner. Um, we'd go to his dad's house and have dinner with his dad and his dad's friends. And then we'd go down and see his dad and all this. And, um, so then one day they're like, okay, Hey, uh, you got to go get fitted for tux. I'm like, ah, cool. You know, whatever. And like, <laughs> but like they're making the tux. It's not a rental. Custom. I'm like, yeah. yeah. I'm like, well, <laughs> yeah. you know, whatever. And so we go to the birthday party and it, they've rented the, the stadium. Okay. So this is the equivalent of like the Georgia dome in Panama. It's where the stadium and okay. there's pyramids built and all this shit and get a bottle of champagne. <laughs> well, it was Manuel Noriega's daughter's 16th birthday. Okay. So, and, and he had just told me, look, the guy that we're having dinner with every Friday night is a general. He's not the president, but he kind of runs the country. <laughs> now I don't know. Right. I mean, I've never heard of the guy. So literally every Friday night we had dinner with Noriega, and then when I went, so then when I went back, went back to America, and he was the most wanted man in the world. A couple of years later, I asked him, I'm like, Where's he? yeah, he's with my dad, you know, he knew where he was and all this. So, but a funny story. So, um, so I'm down there, and I decide that I want a monkey. This is crazy. I want a monkey, right? <laughs> okay. And From Noriega uh, to a monkey. Yeah. So right. I, I look up in my Spanish American dictionary, mono is monkey. So. Get in a cab. I'm like, take me to the market. So he takes me to the market. And I'm walking around. No Espanol. No Espanol. Mono. Ah, oh, they take me over the thing. And this guy's got like, you know, like, remember that show Beretta? What was that? Birdie had a cockatoo or oh, something. Yeah. I mean, yeah, they got cockatoo, parrots, yeah. like lizards, all this. I'm like, monkey, mono. He's like, ah, oh, come back tomorrow. <laughs> so I go home and my friend comes in and he's like, what'd you do today? I'm like, I went to the market. He's like, no, you didn't. I'm like, yeah, I went to the market, man. I got a buying a monkey for 75 bucks he's getting it and bringing it tomorrow he's like dude like that's the deadliest place in panama <laughs> like you and you're a 17 year old american who doesn't speak spanish and you were down there i'm like yeah he's like dude we don't go there without a gun <laughs> oh, no. so anyhow i go back and get the so monkey the next day <laughs> yeah get the monkey the monkey's awesome basente he was super cool and when i fly back to america i've got him in my little carry on bag right and uh we're flying and he's out and we're playing with him in the plane and everything everybody's like ah oh, this is awesome so I get get into america walk through and I'm, they don't really check me in customs because i'm under 18 and i'm 
remember I'm pushing the door open and the guy's like, oh, hey, did you bring some fruit back? And I'm like, nah, didn't bring any fruit. He goes, oh, well, you would mark this. I'm like, oh, yeah, I just brought my monkey. He's like, blah, blah. you know, alarms are going off and they're oh. grabbing me. Oh, my God. What, you can't bring a monkey back in here? And I'm in security and I'm like, <laughs> I'm not giving up the monkey. And finally, it, it got crazy. So, yeah, but um, so then after um, after Panama, it was kind of I went back for my senior year in Illinois. Okay. And, a little different. Uh, yeah. yeah. Went back there. Um, Culture change. And that's reverse. when I was like, yeah, man, like the, the, so golf was really good that year. Um, so how did you manage to keep your game up at this point when you're rocking out in I Panama? Just, just did played. you play some? Yeah. yeah, yeah okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Great, great golf course. Okay. And right. uh, so I came back, reunited with my friends and, you know, qualified for state as an individual, our team qualified. It was a great thing. And we got up there for state championship. And back then, you know, there wasn't a lot of, wasn't a lot of AJGA, that kind of stuff. I mean, right. We had the Pepsi Little Peoples, which is where I met Phil the first time, and that was cool. But um, basically, if you dominated at state, you're going to, that's where you get any college opportunities from right. a small town. And we got up there, and man, we just, I didn't, I, I didn't drink until I was 21. I didn't do anything until I was 21. Um, but we partied like, there was a cheerleading conference at the hotel, so we're, you know, doing all this. And I just shoot a million the next day. <laughs> and I came back after that, and I was just, like, down. Like, I had an opportunity to do something, and I basically wasted it. I mean, I just didn't didn't prepare, didn't act like I cared. And that really kind of hurt me from a golf standpoint. Like, I didn't want – just put my clubs down for a while and was like, you know, I just – that was – it was just stupid, yeah. Right, and it, and it and it upset me. Like, okay, I don't have that chance again. So then I started kind of, you know, pursuing the music thing a little more. And so, what college had to be like in the forefront college here? College in the future, yeah. Yeah, I was like, I what? Mean, do you, like, how are you making these decisions? Like, you're you're, uh, you're thinking about going on tour with a band, or uh, you're well, thinking about college? Like, how does that all fit I'm, in? I'm such an idiot. I don't know how you did you did all the stuff we've talked about. Off, <laughs> off record yeah. at the same time. It's amazing. Uh, yeah. yeah. So yeah, help us fill in the blanks. Yeah, there's a lot more too. You know, so. <laughs> when I was at Military Academy, I was actually a fencer, a junior Olympian. Oh my fencer, God, so, shut yeah. up. Yeah, so that's kind of funny. But you and anyhow, James Hong. Is he a fencer? <laughs> yes, yeah, he was. I'm, I'm not that good, but yeah. So anyhow, mm-hmm. um, I started looking at colleges and was still looking at golf. Right. And so my dad played at Wash U and then transferred to University of Kentucky. So UK was kind of always on my radar. And I went and took a visit and I just didn't like it, you know. And the coach was like, yeah, you know, probably get you a walk on here or something. Mm -hmm. Didn't like it. Um, Went to Mizzou. That's where my mom went. Um, Stan Utley gave me the visit. It was cool. I mean, I've talked to him about it since then. I mean, I didn't know who he was then. Right. I mean, um, looked at that, looked at Ole Miss, which I loved. And then I found out that if you're from. Southern Illinois, it's not the place. I mean, I'm not a, I'm not an Ole Miss guy, right? So, <laughs> um, and then there's a, like a fine art school two hours away that I visited and I didn't like it. Just like, what am I wasting my time for here? You know. But then I ended up going there. <laughs> okay. Um, but this helped your music, right? This that's is sort of why it, I went because I, I kind of, yeah, I'd kind music. of cut the cord with golf at that point. Like I'd kind of been like, okay, you know, this is, and I went and was around some just amazing musicians, amazing, you know, there's arts, there's all these different things. And what's the school called? Millican, Millican University. Okay. Yeah. So, um, and it was just a, wow, this is, you know, I mean, you know, I'm sharing a suite and one guy's a rockabilly chicken picker and you know there's classical players and you, you just got all the all the cool influence different right? yeah, yeah different so, genres it's like fame in the right northeast yeah, yeah. <laughs> so um you know now so that and then then i got into some bands and now we're playing <clears throat> and now you're you're pushing yourself you know and i'm, I'm getting instructed i mean it's funny so you i got up there and you had to do an audition um the first week and, and you just played guitar, obviously. Just that's, oh, I thought were... I thought I was awesome. I mean, I'm walking in like you guys get ready. You're gonna see. You're gonna be blown away. And we walk in. There's like five or six kids sitting in the hallway. These guys are playing shit that like I'm like, huh? What? 
Like, I'm going to come in here and play some White Snake. You know, <laughs> these guys are playing Bach and all this. And I walk in there, like, play this scale. I'm like, I don't even know what you're talking about, bro. Like, you want to hear Still the Night here? Uh, come on, feel some noise. What do you want, man? Some Van Halen? And they're like, look, dude, you're way too far over your head. Like, you can't do it. And I'm like, no, I'll do it. Tell me what to do. I'll do it. And they're like, okay, well, we'll give you a shot. But here's what you do. And Dude, you're, you're chanting Tatum and step up one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> haven't seen that one. That's okay. I thought, Step I thought that Brothers. Go, I thought that go right over yeah, your head. Yeah, but it did, yeah. Okay. So. It'll make sense after you watch it. Yeah. So, <laughs> like, I busted my ass. Like, I worked and just did it, right? And at the end of the first semester, they're like, God, you're so improved. Like, you've really... Yeah. And I'm like, okay, you know? Like, so it's kind of like how you look at golf students, right? Somebody, yeah, yeah. somebody really wants to do it, and they're going to put the time in, and you guide them. They're going to do it. So, so talk about your coaching right there. Like, think, you know, yeah. as, we, as we transition into golf, obviously. Yes. Talk, what was your experience of, like, what your what the instructors were, good right. and bad? Well, yeah, so there was, there was two main guitar instructors there, and they pushed me in that way that they were like, you're not quite good enough. You know, like, so you had a little edge. They either pissed you off or, like, right. you go. Like, and, you know, that can go both ways. Right. right. You could push them in, push them away from it. Yeah, I mean, exactly. I could you have quit gone or you could gone, get, dig yeah. in. Where's the business school? Uh, you know, and uh, but they were kind of like, you know, look, yeah, it probably could, but then I would ask them, and I and, and I was always asking for more. Like, what if I do this? If I can play this, is that what's next? That kind of stuff. And mm-hmm. I want this. Nah, that's too advanced. Ah, well, let me learn. And then when I did it, and the compliments and the praise that came from it was over the top. Sure. Right, like, that meant a lot more wow, to you. Wow, sure. Like, you know and so that was it was it was really cool i mean and you know look i look at it now with the juniors i work with you know or did a bigger junior falling in atlanta but you know sometimes that little praise or that little thing that you say to them it doesn't mean a whole lot i mean it means a lot coming from it's a quick saying but that will grab them you know like oh coach said i did this and yeah, I remember that. And they were they were very cool. Um, we we had a a class called Rock Lab, okay. And they put everybody in a fishbowl, like guitarist, bassist, drummer, singer, keyboard player, blah blah blah. And they drew them out, and you were a band. So come up with a set list, and you had to play a show to get credit. Okay. So you might have a right up jazz alley. bassist. Yeah. You know, you might have a classical singer who knows you know and and so we did that and that was that was crazy there's a there is a video of it out there it's, i was about to I say mean, is yeah. any of this on documentation this is yeah it's, <laughs> it's kind of funny um i still keep in touch with those guys because one of them was my college roommate who was awesome and you know and that was it, we weren't a great band by any stretch of the imagination but it showed you had to you had to collaborate sure then i remember i guess it was my sophomore year my parents were not over they called it heavy metal university um <laughs> okay they're kind of like hey look you know this isn't you need to do something i'm like ah oh, no man it's awesome and then one of the guys who was like he was like the best guitarist there and he'd gone to la and he came back and we're all like oh he's gotta be a rock star he's like oh man i'm playing a holiday in at night and i'm like you know vacuuming hotel rooms in the day and we're like what like it's mean, not you're glamorous not, but you're good yeah yeah, yeah you know so I started thinking, you know, I kind of maybe need to think about things that talent equals success, right? Like if you're the best accountant in the world, there's a good chance you're going to be successful. Like somebody will pick you up, right? Best guitarist in the world, you probably don't know who it is. I mean, I couldn't say I know who it is. I mean, there's guys, I see these guys on social media, they're phenomenal. Mm-hmm. I mean, but typically like the really, really good guitar players aren't in the major they're not the ones making in the major bands right yeah. really oh, interesting yeah. Yeah, okay I mean, look i mean nobody did you know, you take mick mars from molly crew like that guy's not the best guitarist in the world right and one of the richest yeah he got <laughs> got into a nice situation right, right? um so i started going ah oh, shit man i don't know what to do and so my criteria became i don't want to wear a tie and i don't want to do math over 80 so that narrowed it down <laughs> Right. And uh, so my senior year, I uh, was cruising along. Um, 
you know, had hair down to my ass and was still rocking out and thinking that was going to be the thing. Grunge started coming in and that put an end to the music I played like instantly, like overnight there was, you were just a D bag. If you had long hair and I had a pound of Aquanet in my hair and, you know, was wearing ripped up shirts and all this. And you were just now instantly awful. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Overnight. It was, (laughs) and, um, so I'm home at Christmas that right before my last semester. And that's when my dad got diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. They're like, okay, he's got three months. And I'm like, fuck this. I'm going to go back to school. Done. Mm. Not going, you know, and I'm going to stay home. He's like, now you're going, you're going. So I went back to school and, uh, I just went up to every teacher first day. And I'm like, look, my dad's dying of cancer. Um, I'm taking your class because I have to. I want to be home. I'm not going to show up. I'll do whatever work you want, but I'm not going to show up. And I just... Like mentally, you're not showing up. No, like physically, I'm not Oh, you're not... Okay. No. I'm not showing up for anything. (laughs) Okay. Yeah. And they're like, all right, we get it. Yeah. So I would get up in the morning and I'd just go to the golf course and just hit balls. So golf kind of became your... That was... Getaway. I'm just like... Mentally. I'm going to go out and hit balls. Now, remember, I never had a range as a kid. Yeah. So it was all of a sudden this place that was a little new, kind of exciting. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, sit out there and hit balls and, you know, do that for the day. Um, ironically, the only year, year in my life I made the dean's list was that semester. <laughs> how's, that, I, how's that possible? And I went to like, literally, I think I went to six in-person classes that, <laughs> in that whole semester. Well, hopefully not the college kids aren't listening out there. Mm. That's not the way to go. Not the way to go, no, no. <laughs> Um, That's but crazy. yeah, I just, you know, it just, it kind of came back, right? Yeah. Like that was what my dad and I had. We played a lot. Of I was golf about games. to say, did, did you have a connection with your dad as yeah, far as golf, right? That's where, yeah. I mean, you know, when talk I about was, that a little bit. So, you know, in high school, I mean, you know, you're going through something, ah, I'm breaking up with a girlfriend, whatever. My dad yeah. and I go out and play and, you know, you could kind of talk to him. I mean, I, Still to this day, I remember the first day I dropped an F bomb <laughs> slam in a club, and I was like, "Is he gonna kick my ass?" You know, yeah. whatever. And, yeah. and but no, it was just that's kind of where we went and and had talks. Mm-hmm. And you know, we could go out there and we might not say anything for five holes, and then we might, you know. And he was a great putter, like the best putter I've ever met, <laughs> ever. Um, actually, you can see that's actually his putter sitting over there. That old my day. Okay. Um, and. uh just the best putter. His golf swing was awful. Like it was bad, <laughs> but he, it, it, it worked enough, yeah. but I'd sit there and bomb it by him and hit it up there and he'd make putts and I'd miss putts. And I was just like, oh, this sucks. You know, I hit it better than you. He's like, ah, it's not about that. You know, that yeah. kind of thing. And so it was, um, that was, that was our time and that was like our, and we, I guess, you know, I mean, I remember the, the the last round we actually played together, we were playing with a friend of mine and his dad, and young guys versus old guys, and we just talked so much smack, and they beat us. And, I mean, it was just one of those things like, we played better, they scored better, beat us. And Is this when he was sick? or It was right uh, before four, he was sick. Yeah, yeah, sick like, yeah. yeah, like four months before, maybe. Um, once he was sick, I, I you know, I was playing a lot then. I mean, I was, that's all I was doing. I mean, so I literally definitely all into golf now. Wake, wake up, go to the golf course, you know, come down, see him, you know. And I said, you know, I wanted to, can you, can you come out and ride, you know, and yeah. see something that he couldn't. And, mm. um, he's supposed to live three months, lived six, saw my college graduation nice. and okay. lived just past he and my mom's 25th anniversary. Okay. So, yeah. um, and then, so <laughs> at this point, this is how fucked up my life. Like, right? Like, I'm like, okay, I'm supposed to be an attorney because my dad was a judge. And so I'm going to go to Pepperdine to law school. Right? This You, you were going to go? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. After Enrolled. A Millican. Enrolled. Okay. And uh, I'm sitting there with my mom and I'm like, she's like, is that what you really want to do? And I'm like, I don't know. She's like, do you really want to do it? And I'm like, look, I didn't study a day in my life in Decatur, Illinois. You're going to put me in Malibu, California. Beach, mountains, women, and tell me to go to law school. I'm wasting your money. I'm going to waste your money. I don't want to do that. I want to pursue the golf thing. And 
It's like, all right, do it. So what did that look like? What did, what did you, what were your goals then like, um, to go play the tour? Or? I didn't know. I mean, what, yeah, it was like, who do you, who do you go talk to at this point to get any guys? It's funny that I didn't know who to talk to. Right. You yeah. Know? So, so I ended up going down to Mississippi state. Right. You know, that, that, I knew that would come to yeah, getting so, into PGM. Um, yeah. PGM program. And how'd and you find that? Like who, who I heard kinda, about it from a, kid i played high school golf against okay. you know he had said that and so i went down there and it was it was good um it wasn't wasn't great because i had already had a four-year degree sure. so that was the hard part right? yeah it was almost like, like a grad school without like i'm really like, any meat. so we went went like a couple of years and then it's like oh we in two and a half years with this and i'm like whoa whoa, whoa. going like eight and a half years of college like this you know and <laughs> what <laughs> you know yeah. and so i'd been working with todd anderson um at that point coaching and had gone to work for him and i'm like i don't know what to do he's like just come teach with me i'm like bam so left spent the where was he at the, elk the river time? at the time oh yeah, yeah. Elk river in the mountains. Yeah, 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 so, um, that was god's place man that oh yeah i've been so there. good so good uh and so i'd i'd spend the summer and then he's like come and work for me in the winter so probably your first break really if you think back on it right golf wise first right? golf break yeah because yeah. there was no breaks happening from Florida, illinois i was gonna okay, there's no, <laughs> nothing yeah and he's like do you teach at golf digest school you'll be an assistant and i'm like perfect so yeah. um and so i went down there and, and my first year i was you know i'm a grunt right okay paint the lines and they said set up the video and you're going to run the video. Okay, well, I had two massive VHS cameras, those huge VHS cameras. Oh, yeah, right? I remember. We had an AB splitter box and a 13-inch black and white TV that they drew dry erase markers on, right? So I'm splitting the screen, and I'm watching them teach. And so, you know, I'm like, okay, learning, right? And we do this. And so my learning curve, and this is, you know, it's funny, I, I was – listening to your podcast with Eric Alpenfels, who's mm -hmm. a good friend of mine who also, you know, he's a golf school guy. And we've talked about this a lot. And I said, you know, so like at the end of my first year, I would say, okay, if I saw a student and Flick was teaching, okay, here's what Flick's going to teach. If John Elliott was teaching, here's, here's what I think John's going to say. You know, if Todd was teaching, that's what he's going to say. Yeah. So then I went back to Elk River, went through another season there, you know, okay, this is good. Then second year of golf digest schools, I'm watching students and I'm like, okay, this is what so-and-so is going to say, but I think so-and-so would say it better. I was starting to understand styles, communication, right? Like right. what, why, you know, and, and I remember Todd saying to me, he goes, look, man, this was when I was starting to get ready to teach. He's like, look, you know what causes a hook? I'm like, yeah. He's like, but the difference between you and I is I can tell them five different ways to stop it. You can tell them one. And I'm like, he's like, well, we all know what causes it, right? Okay, well, it's going left. The face, let's say the face same left. Okay, that's great. But how are you going to tell him how to stop it? He's like, you know, I can learn. I can tell you five ways. You can tell me one. Mm -hmm. And by my third year, um, I would look at a student and go, okay, here's what so-and-so would do. Here's what so-and-so would do. Here's what I'd do. This, this would be my approach. And that's when I, and I mean, I sat down with Dodd. And he doesn't have a clue how big of a mentor he is. I mean, like, I've talked to him. He still doesn't know. I mean, he had mm -hmm. massive effect on me. And he's like, yeah, you probably need to go on your own. You know, you probably need to start teaching. And um, so I went, went to Birmingham, worked at a club that was new, Old Overton, which was fabulous. Um, community course, brand new golf course, great golf course, great head professional. Jim Brotherton Jr., he's PG. So you were the head year. teaching pro, or were you like just an assistant? Part assistant, just like yeah. But they didn't have anything. Like there's nobody teaching. Yeah. So you so came I in, teaching. yeah. Basically more experienced than the rest of the guys. Just, yeah, so. and I was passionate. I'm like, I'm yeah. gonna buy a laptop and I'm gonna have a video thing and all this. Yeah. And it blew up, and I was just teaching so much. And um, Jim, who he was national professional of the year, he's in the Hall of Fame, and he was like grooming me to be head professional right mm -hmm. and we had some good talks and then i i just was like i just don't know man i just I 
just don't know if that's it. And the Atlanta Athletic Club job became available. Um, and I interviewed and got it, and I talked to Jim, and I'm just like, look, this is, this is what I want to do. It's a big job. Yeah. yeah I, mean, awesome. I mean, at the time, it probably wasn't. It was, yeah. Now. It was right. But, like, it's that's that's an awesome club, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. It was crazy. Um, and he's like, I think that's great, man. Just do what do what your passion is. Like, if you want to teach, I'm like, Jim, I don't. I don't want to run a tournament. Yeah. I don't want to yeah. inventory shirts. That's, I just, this is what I like. And it's funny. I took that job more because I wanted to be in the Pacific Northwest. <laughs> if it, you know, I just wanted to be out there, right? I wanted to be in Rocky Mountains or Portland or something, you know, be a grunger or whatever. <laughs> and uh, I hadn't gotten any job interviews. Like I'm sending my resume off and nothing's happening. They're like, dude, you're coming from Alabama. Yeah. Like, you know, you're going to pull a trailer up. I'm like, no, it's a great place, you know. So I figured if I go to Atlanta. So what do you think got you the job at Atlanta? Like, what do you remember that, that interview? I remember the interview, yeah. yeah. To, so Tommy Brandon, if you know Tommy. I know the name. Tommy yep. had, Legend. Just, yeah, had just left to take the director of golf at Augusta Country Club. Yep, there you go. And had built a, an amazing learning center there. Like, it was off the chain. You know, I remember going over and. You know, I was probably, I was probably ahead of who I was, who I should have been as an assistant. Like I had a laptop and I had a, I don't remember if it was V1, it's what system I was using, but I was using some system and I had a program, right? Like I had books of like, okay, this is what my winter program was like, where we trained in the men's locker room in the winter and, you know, just different. I mean, I'm an outside the box guy, right? So I'm like, yeah. you know, oh, we'd do this and this was and I had all these programs and I think I don't expect that many people came in with that much. Like they probably came in and said, I can teach, you know, I played in this, I did this. And it's just like, look, I got a game plan, you know, and here's what it is. And here's what my philosophy is and, and all this. And, you know, at this, so at the time, uh, too, did you go through business school or you go through? G- yeah. B- business did- school one, two, and okay. then three was the last Okay. bit before they changed over and so i was a member and didn't have to do it so i was i got grandfathered in i was in the first class with the gptp the new system gotcha yeah so as soon as i graduated they put a thing out that you could be faculty so i was like i wanted to be involved in something so i became involved in that so i was on the faculty for the gptp and was traveling around teaching you know and I knew what I wanted when I went This through. is after you were at Atlanta? I wasn't even in Atlanta yet. Oh, this is before. I mean, okay. yeah. I'm yeah, like yeah. So, 26 years old. Yeah, I was going to say, this has to be yeah. mid-20s. And and teach, but I knew what I, what I, I knew what the program lacked for me. Like, I wanted yeah. more of the teaching and all that. So, I was going out and doing that, and that almost kept me from getting the athletic club job because he's like what you're going to be gone i was about to say like traveling 25 days a year whatever i'm like yeah but you know it's pga it's um so and i was there maybe a year and a half maybe um and our gm came up to me and he's like hey golf club of georgia is starting an instruction program uh they're looking for somebody i gave him your name you have an interview tomorrow and I went over really? and they offered me the job. They didn't have anybody. They'd never done anything. The pay was... Were they trying to get rid of you? or were they? Try- <laughs> no, I think I think Chris, who are, was our GM, kind of knew I was, I was frustrated. I okay. was a little bit of a... Felt like I wasn't the right fit, and it wasn't, wasn't right. Okay. And yeah, I got yeah. to go to a place where I was setting up my own thing, and the expectations were high, and I could do what I wanted, and I went nuts. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. So I'm wondering if this is... The time when I first saw you, we talked about this when we had beers at, after the beer yeah, camp. Yeah, right there. Um, the, um, what's that? The paperweight right there. Yeah. That's it from the Carolina section. Oh, yeah. That was, <laughs> yeah. So you, you, I saw you where you, you gave the hardest practice program. Yeah, yes. The that was the, practice that was, routine. That was the area, the area meeting that I saw you. Yeah. At, I think that was about this time. Is it early 2000s? I want to say three, four-ish, maybe. Yeah, I probably. I can't remember. Probably that area. I Dude, mean, you seem like you've done like twenty years in like five years. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Felt like it. Right? That's a compliment, yeah. but I mean, okay, it's like yeah. no, seriously, it's like it's amazing how quickly you've transformed your career it, and made decisions 
It seems like like you call it luck. That's bullshit. No, okay? it is luck. No, it's 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 obviously you got to have some breaks along the way. Sure, but you've created those situations. The golf club at Georgia job was a that was a break. Going in and having a blank slate, right? And mm. it was a players' club, new money, a lot of good players, and then out of the blue. The Taylor made mat system comes in and we get that the right. first 3D motion capture system. I mean, that was without a doubt a career changer for me. Right. So, so talk lead. That's a good lead into early technology. Right. Yeah. Right. That's yeah. before gears, before yeah, TrackMan, before a before lot of anything. stuff we're using now. And we had a discussion. and We've talked about this yep. a couple of times, but like, how did that come about? What you learned from it, and then it created that opportunity for you to speak at the. Yeah, it's coaching summit. Teaching yeah. summit. Yeah, I mean that's amazing. It was uh it all happened fast. They came in and they said, Hey, we're thinking about doing this thing. One of our board members, I think was an investor in the company that was making it. And they had made like some movies, Avatar and stuff that they were Yeah. And so we went and looked at it and I said, you know, this is <laughs> cool. Yeah. And so the next thing I know, it's in our building. We made a room for it and so these engineers are there and they're showing me how to like scale people, right? And put the dots on and all this. And so then somebody hits a shot and I'm like, okay, well, what's that mean? Right. Like what, what does, what's good? What's okay. There's their knee angle and there's their, the, what's good. I don't know what's good. And they're like, we don't know. We just coded this thing, man. You know, so it's up to us to like figure it out. Right. Yeah. yeah. And there wasn't a baseline. It's like, you know, we're chatting about this earlier, mm -hmm. like, you didn't know. I mean, you kind of knew. You kind of know what you think, right? But at the same time, it's never been measured, really. Right. So I spent spent a few weeks out in Carlsbad um, at TaylorMade, who had the original system. Spent a lot of time with a guy named Brian Basil, who's a close friend of mine. And he's we're going through and we're looking at, what do you see pattern-wise with good players, bad players, all this kind of stuff, you know? What happens if we move the markers? If we put them on wrong... Does that give you a skewed version? All this uh -huh. stuff. And then I just jumped on it and just ran with it, man. I was just <laughs> like, this is great. I mean, I remember being there at 830 at night, just having, hey, hit some ball, you know, pulling one of the food service guys. Hey, come down here and hit a shot because I'm trying to figure this out. Yeah. So were there any commonalities? Like you said, dude, it's, it's yes. again, it's, it's like we look at back in even ball flight days, right? Right. Started figuring stuff out with track, man gears mm -hmm. and even you know amm before right. which kind of the original i guess after yep. the mat system do you remember anything that's sort of like all right what i'm getting at is like that you start formulating a framework of like all right nobody does everything exactly right. the same but you start thinking about matchups and what works and what, what what doesn't so work. so two things that i always thought were interesting um and i'm not saying this is correct now by all the information we have but what we saw okay was that with every elite ball striker at that time um which were all tailor-made staffers okay sergio and this kind of guys that at impact their shoulder lines were identical and on top of their toe line okay hmm. so i go to the coaching summit and i present that and i say here's what we see hips are massively open but the shoulders are on top of the toe line. So they're not outside the toe line. They're not open to the toe line, nothing. Hardy presents right after me. And he's yep, like, I remember that. That. he's like, blew it up with the one plane, two plane. Shoulders got to be 20 degrees open. And I'm going, but he's not measuring. I'm like, we just, I just, sh I mean, that's one of the first things that we, and then one of the, one of the things I loved was on the putting. So this was the kind of around the year Fred Funk, made the Ryder cup, like, right, like out of the blue, right. Won the players mm -hmm. once we had him putting and I would show it to young students and I'd say, okay, look at this, look at this setup. What would you change? And they're like, well, his shoulders are closed. His feet are open. His forearms are jacked up. And I'm like, okay, well you just cost him the Ryder cup. Like, because his, his path and face were so good. Right. But yeah. his setup was jacked up and I'm like, don't, look at something until you see what's going on. There you go. Right. Yeah. Like don't you're, I mean, yeah, it's easy to see his feet are going here. His shoulders are over here. It's all jacked up, but you haven't seen the result yet. And this guy's coming in with a zero face angle every time. Dude, this guy's 47 years old or whatever. He's going to play on the Ryder cup and you're going to square his shoulders. And that's, 
not the right answer. That's a that's Redeep. a learning moment, right? Exactly, right. and that's the way you measure. Yeah, you don't measure because you have. I mean, it's it's difficult to come into any situation without having a bias. Or sure. What we'd call preferences, right? Yeah. We all do. Yeah, we but, do, yeah. But you've got to have that restraint to go, all right, let's, let's, like, yeah. it looks funky. Okay, let's see what happens. Yeah. Okay. Well, wow, that was good. Okay, that, that was good. Wow, yeah. That was good again. Okay, now you've got a decision to make, right? right. Do I change this because it's yeah. going to look better? Yeah. <laughs> right. Is it going to perform better? Well, probably not. Yeah, exactly. You know? Exactly. That's so cool. All right, you want to take a break and get some more wine? We need to. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Now we're back. Okay. Yeah. On, uh, open the door for a second, please. Yeah. Ma! Meatloaf! <laughs> <laughs> I had to give her that. There it is. Yeah. <laughs> What's your favorite movie? Oh, man. Um, you know what? I Everybody goes Shawshank, right? And I love that. But um, That's a good one. Into the Wild. Ooh, that's different. Yeah. that That's one of those that just... Gets me in every. What's, what's that about? I'm not, uh, I'm not sure. I've seen it. Really, like, Chris I mean, I've McCandless. Seen every freaking movie ever. Alexander Supertramp. So it's about a kid. He uh, graduates from Emory and takes all his savings and sells it and moves to Alaska. Documents it. It's a true story. So my movies, and any of my friends will tell you this: if it can't really happen or didn't really happen, I won't watch it. So if you talk to me about. Any science fiction movie? So or the something? Marvels are out. Uh, yeah, I'm out. I mean, it's I I love documentaries. I mean, I watch Detective Files and Forensic Files and Forty Eight Hours and all that stuff. But okay. Into the Wild, um, one of the great movies. Vince Vaughn's in it as like a okay. secondary character. It is, I you know I know you ask about books that people gift and stuff. Yeah. I gift that book a lot because it's just a. Man, there's some great quotes. He's living in Alaska in this bus, and it's it's not a happy story in any shape of the imagination, yeah. but it's it's good. But um, from a comedy standpoint, I love some Step Brothers. <laughs> I bet <laughs> you do. So, but you know, so Christy loves Wedding Crashers. Love it too. And um, yeah. so you know, I don't know if you know, but you know, I taught Owen Wilson for a while. Oh, I did not know that. Yeah, okay, so, talk about that. So yeah, so. Got to meet him through his publicist was looking for a golf instructor. So I kind of got it hooked up with that. And that opened up a whole door because that's right when Atlanta was making a lot of movies. A lot of movies there. There's so a lot I, of movies been made in Atlanta. Yeah. So in there, in my closet in here. Sorry for you listeners. When <laughs> there's a closet in there with a bunch of money. We threatened to yeah. video this, but we just, yeah, did, so just couldn't make it happen. For her birthday, I got a Wedding Crashers, the actual theater poster, and had... Owen and Vince sign it for. Her. And so she loves that. So um their publicist, it was Owen and Vince's publicist. And so I started getting a lot of actors as students and started playing a lot of golf with them and started running around with them a lot, you know, like going, Oh, hey, we're shooting, come and do this. So um the Fairley brothers were shooting a movie called Hall Pass in Atlanta. Yeah. And I was don't I seriously was on the set, like Every other night, oh and just be gosh. like Aga Dan. So I'm in it. Um, you have to don't blink. You know, you miss me. <laughs> so I was supposed to be the marshal, and then in the, like the last second, they hired an actual actor. But I'm in there, and I'm actually a golf pro teaching um, Billy Andrade's brother. And Billy Andrade's brother has been in every movie the Fairley Brothers have made. They're very big about putting cameos for friends of theirs. Okay, and so I have to look at that. Yeah, so it's fun. I've seen I mean, that movie a lot. Yeah. Yeah, it's fun. Yeah, it's cool. I'm in the golf scene where they're eating the pop brownies. So <laughs> okay. this is a film to Druid you Hills to, in the You have to put it. You have to point and it. So out. then, I mean, then we were going up and we were hanging out with my buddy in Chicago, and they're like, "Oh, we're filming, um, you know, some sci-fi movie, and we're hanging there, and you know, that's Vince's hometown in Chicago." And, I mean, it just became. We took we took the directors to the Masters. Um, Did you we, meet Vince Vaughn at all? Or yeah, 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 yeah. yeah so. Okay. He's cool. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Cool as he appears or like different? Like Very a, much like what he is. Is, um, is Owen kind of the same? or Owen's different. Yeah. Um, you know, Owen's... Owen's uh, what kind of student was Owen? Because I've taught a lot of professional athletes. They're not yeah. always the best. No, nah, he was not easy. I mean, I would... So my thing was I always had to block a couple hours. And we had to have it to where like the driver would... Park at the back of the lot, 
I'd pick him up on a card yeah. because if people see under the radar type right, of deal, yeah, and it'd be like, "Hey man, I'm uh, on my way, but Woody Harrelson just called, and we're gonna go paintballing." Okay, yeah, you just lost two hours, right? Yeah, yeah. So there's they a lot of care. that. Yeah, yeah, there's a lot of that. Yeah. Um, Get it. Vince is kind of the uh, bipolar guy that he seems like super on, super off. Yeah, um, ten or two. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, you know who we played with that was that was super cool is um, uh, his name Jason um, Sudeikis. No, no. We, uh, no, Jason. Jason was cool. He was in Hall Pass. Yeah, yeah. That's, um, what, that's what I was thinking. Um, another guy is King of Queens. Was that movie of the TV show King of Queens? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he's in a movie called what was it? His wife hooked up with somebody, and Vince Vaughn. Knew it, and it was best friends. The dilemma. Oh, the dilemma. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. He's super golf nut. Played yeah. Olympic fields with him, and he's. I'm looking super, it up right now. Yeah. Seen the movie. Yeah. How do I not know? You know what I'm talking about, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. What the heck wasn't it coming up? <laughs> Freaking Channing Jason. Tatum was in that. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> remember right. that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was like the. Yeah, Jason. Um, Kevin James? Kevin James. Oh, yeah, that's, yeah, that's what yeah. I'm saying. Yeah, okay, uh, Kevin James. Yeah. So you see where I, you see why I'm a golf pro, right? <laughs> I mean, I don't even know anybody's <laughs> name, right? So he was awesome. And then... He um, seemed like he'd be cool. Then we got... Um, we started getting the Marvel movies. And so we had um, Falcon and Warhammer. So... Um, <laughs> okay. Okay, so Falcon is... He's a superhero. <laughs> See, I don't, I don't watch Marvel movies. Well, I do, but that that one's not on. So we were playing golf a lot, and talking about Falcon and the Winter Soldier. I don't know <laughs> Falcon and Warhammer. That's all I know him as, and I I got a video of him. Um, Anthony Mackie's in Anthony it. Mackie. Yeah. So and there you then, go. He's in We Are Marshall. Okay. Yeah. Right. That's go. right. Yeah. My wife went to Marshall. And, um, big, big influence. Warhammer is. Uh, it's Sebastian Stan. No, no, he's huge. Wyatt Russell. No, huge, huge actor. So I'm looking at like Academy this, Award winner. Like this, the, he was in Crash, which is a the great Falcon movie. and the Winter Soldier. He's big time, right? And he's super cool. Yeah, I don't. There's no Warhammer coming up, dude. I don't Seriously? know where Warhammer is. Yeah, that's not. I don't know. That's what I thought he <laughs> said when he did the video for my kids. Okay, look up Crash. Movie Crash. Is he in Crash? Oh yeah. Shoot, that's that's uh That's an old school one. Yeah, yeah, but that's you probably think Don Cheadle? Don Cheadle. Yeah, oh yeah. Yeah, that's Don Cheadle. Yeah, yeah. there you go. Oh yeah. So big time. Love so that guy. We'd play with them. <laughs> and I remember I called Christy and I'm like, Hey, I'm playing with Anthony Mackey and Don Cheadle. We're gonna play another nine. So she came out and she, you know, having some cocktails and they're just talking smack and Don Eagle's last hole, so he's like, We gotta play another nine and <laughs> And I'm talking to him. I mean, he's he's a serious actor. Like, oh yeah, yeah. He's like he is awesome on his craft. Like it's like okay, I'm not doing this for money. I'm doing this to act. And Anthony Mackie and I are talking, and he was like, "Yeah, I was going to play football." He's like, "So I went to Michigan. I was defensive back." And he's like, second day, I'm playing, and I see this play break, and I'm ready." And he's like, "Dude, the biggest." white guy i've ever seen just lays me out blindsides me he's like i'm done i'm out <laughs> and he's a he's a saints fan so we would we would talk smack about yeah. that but you know getting getting to know those guys and when you get to know them on a personal level i mean most of them are cool they all have some issues sure i mean everybody, everybody does, does right right but you know i i would say you know like you know you look at a guy like owen wilson who's making 20 million a picture and they're filming for at the same time and life is great and you know, but we took so we took the directors and the producers to Augusta, and it was the year Phil hit the shot right from the trees. Mm -hmm. So we were there on Sunday, which I hate being there on Sunday. Yeah, I've been there a know? few times just because, yeah, you get a ticket. I, I hate being there, right? You miss so much golf, right? So now we're in the car for like five hours coming back, right? Because it's the end of the day, yeah, and they've had a bunch of cocktails and. Christy just starts asking him questions like, who's this? What's this guy like? And it yeah. was awesome. Yeah, that's <laughs> I mean, when you we went, got some dirt. That's when you get the tea. Oh, it was great. Yeah, it was yeah. awesome. But um, I get it. You know, it's fun. I mean, they're people, right? I mean, I'm not starstruck. Okay. I've been yeah. starstruck once. Yeah, I'm I'm kind of the same way. I've been around a lot of celebrities and you, know, you teach them. I've right. worked with Kevin Harvick and a lot of yeah, whatever. Yeah. But 
like he probably liked me because I could care less about racing. Right. You know what I mean? I'm just right. like, I just want to get you better golf. But um, you're probably more starstruck, I'm guessing, with, with uh, bands. <laughs> and relations. Like, and musicians, right? So, uh, so Van Halen's your favorite it's, band. It is, yeah. So, so talk a little bit about that history and mm-hmm. like, because we talked a little bit about Tool and yep. like collective soul i know you know right? the guy yeah, like, yeah, yeah. so talk talk to me about so, that tell me some stories so okay yeah, we'll get stories. back into the golf i, I promise stories. but this is this is important this, so this is important we are in uh we're sitting in my studio right now which is basically a shrine <laughs> to van Halen. <laughs> it is right i mean there's a lot of stripes and there's a lot of stuff going on in here and that's just been my thing i mean since i was 13 12 whatever what that, was it i mean what i, mean, I don't know I don't know. There's just something, and it was like, I mean, this is this is cool. The emotion, you know. I mean, and I used to have this big. <laughs> I used to be a big, like, okay. There's Van Halen. There's Van Hagar, and they don't equal and all this. I mean, it's funny. Like your Billboard question, which I'm sure will come up at some point. I used to think as I was driving, listening to this, I'm like, yeah. I was going to say, you know, look. There's Van Halen and there's Van Hagar, but only one is really, you know, like, I mean, yeah, because, but, you know, I've appreciate, I appreciate them both, but, you know, it's just the thing to me was watching how much fun Eddie had playing the hardest shit in the world. Like he was always smiling and I've written golf articles on it, on how yeah. he's laughing and why aren't we, why are we out there slamming a club? Like, laugh and enjoy and and have fun right like and just my friend like i said my friend gave me a record and i put it on i was just like was it fair warning uh it was, it, it was women and children first okay because uh, i read it i was going through your instagram yeah fair warning is my favorite you're talking about fair warning it's the best the album cover everything and, yeah like like i want you to elaborate on that a little bit yeah. but Keep going. I don't want to interrupt, but I want you to know no. that I've done some research. Yeah. So yeah, fair warning. <laughs> fair warning to me is like that's the desert island, right? Like if I had one, it's got everything I, I think is that's Van Halen to a T to me. Um, and uh, it just was, it was creative, right? It was creative. It was a little angry, but it was a little happy, but it was a little something you could get your head around. And man, that was it. And my goal, my lifetime, I always said, if I ever meet Eddie, and Eddie was a golfer. I know, a little bit. And was a Cobra guy, which I'm a Cobra. I mean, like, you see videos of him, he's wearing a Cobra hat. If I ever met him, I was getting him to sign my arm, and I was going straight to a tattoo parlor. And I was getting tattooed. So, didn't happen. What um, what question would you ask him about guitar playing if you had a chance? Um, that's a good, man. That's a good question because I would have been so starstruck. I mean, once you get past all that, like right. you guys are just hashing it out, going, "Man, how did you learn this? Nah, and I, what? How do you do this? Like, it'd be kind of like asking Tiger Woods how do you get yeah, the shot. Nah, right? I probably, I probably would ask him about like the neck profile on his guitars. Like, which one was the one that like what? Because they changed so much. The, the width, the width Thickness, of them, yeah, yeah. roundness, yeah. all that, and like, okay. um, you know, I've got, yeah, I've got a lot of Van Halen yeah. guitars. Yeah, in there. And I they, wish they, we should have we should have videoed. But they're they're each different. But we need but a crew. There's, <laughs> but there's um, there's a certain profile on each one, and and some, and I would say, you know, like what one was the one, you know, that you really, and I've asked through social media, I've asked Michael Anthony, who was the basis of Van Halen, like, look. We hear everything that's recorded, but when you're rehearsing, that's when the, I mean, that's when the music, that's the magic, right? Like, right. was there something that ever happened that you're just like, <sighs> like the lost files, right? Yeah. yeah, and he's like, oh, dude, like it was nightly, right? Like, Had to just be. something would happen, but he'd be experimenting. But the amazing thing is, like, when they're in it, they're probably don't even realize you don't realize the how they don't realize how good it is from the outside looking in. Like, this was the gold, right? So you know, it's funny. That you said that, um, and I didn't make a lot of notes for this. Okay, I'm, I'm winging it. Here. No, hey, it's the only way I. You're do the it. guest, but the the I do have. I did put something down, and I said, "Please share that I relate uh, ball flight laws to a music key." Okay, that's a confined law, right? But playing golf 
is like improvising. Okay, you have the key and you have the notes, but when you're playing, you're you're letting it go. You're going, okay, you know, maybe you know I can hit a wrong note, or I can bend a note, or I can do something a little wrong. Like I'm confined by one thing. I I got a playing key, and that's the ball flight loss. Okay, you know, here's what happens if the face is this and the path is this. But musically, like, and and I've I. Almost every newsletter article I write has some music thing in it, you know? And I'm like, okay, look, I sat in my dorm room and practiced scales for hours with a metronome, right? And if you'd said, okay, play something, I would have played it and it would have sounded like Rob practicing with a metronome. Blah, 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 you know? Mm -hmm. But when you're actually playing and and you let it go, and I mean, all of a sudden you, you play something different. You play something more like... Wow, what did I do? I don't know. Well, the same thing in golf, right? Yeah. Like intuition, like all the all the stuff that you've trained, and you go kind of comes out, right? Yeah, I mean, look, I think everybody high handicaps anything. You've you've gotten behind a putt, and you're like, "Fuck, I'm gonna make this." Yeah. Like, you, hurry up and make get yours out of the way because I know. Yeah, that feeling. Like, why do you know you're gonna make it? Yeah, you just do, and you and you do. Right, or mm-hmm. you have stand over a shot, and, or you, or sometimes you pull a shot off that you shouldn't pull off, and I think that's the playing aspect, right? Sure. Like, um, we have hours of CDs and recordings of our jam sessions, and I would listen to them and be like, "God, what I play? I don't even remember what I, I just it just happened, you know." Mm-hmm. And that's that's the stuff. Like, I would love to have that from a band because you know sure. it just. Yeah. I mean that guy was over the top creative. So yeah. What were the other bands that you like enjoyed? Oh, I know man. we talked about Tool a little bit because mm-hmm. I, I was into and still am. I just don't listen to it as much. It's kind of the alternative rock yeah, right. scene. Yeah, yeah, sure. Which your band? Talk about your band Drift. I mean, uh, and, yeah, and, then, so, and then your new band, the the other band. No, that, yeah. So so Drift was my bigger band in Atlanta. I mean, we were kind of a you know kind of that newer modern rock mm-hmm. thing. Um, had a lot of I mean. I think you'll hear a lot of influences of both, you know, Van Halen and other stuff. You know, I mean, it's kind of that. And uh, we we're fun. It was a fun band. Traveled a lot. Um, German and I are still super close friends. Um, I think we were kind of more of a sound of say Incubus, maybe oh, love that kind it. of thing. Yeah. Um, our album, I think, turned out really good for the most part. It was. You say you can find it on iTunes? Yeah, it should be out there. Yeah, Yeah, it should be out there. I know that our drummer gets a check for 99 cents every month, (laughs) you know, for whatever. Somebody somebody got a song or something. But, um, and I have about 3,000 CDs downstairs of, you know, um, but no, the album was left at Otley. And it was funny because a rehearsal studio was at Otley. You turned left to get there and we kind of played that whole thing. And it was great. We put on a really good show. Our, the singer was an IT guy, and so we had a video screen that synced up with everything, and it was sweet. It was, I mean, for a club band, it was, yeah, it was cool. Um, band yeah. before Moments from Impact, name that kind of played into golf, right? Almost, almost kind of a golf thing, right? Well, that's how. I, yeah. yeah, that's that yeah. was. I, I, love I, it. I, I came up with that, and that was it. Mm-hmm. Moments from Impact, and um, we were kind of a heavy Goo Goo Dolls type thing. Had yeah. one song that was a single. Um, that got local play and that was cool. And we did, we did a lot of stuff. So we'd do a lot of like, uh, remake covers, right. Mm-hmm. You know, like we'd, we'd pick an old song and, and make it modern. And I that like was it. fun. Yeah. That was, that was a good time. And so you, you left off with how your band ended, I guess, or what your, what your genre was. Yeah. yeah and then yeah, you yeah. were, you were telling some stories, you had some good stories about some of the the band members you've met, some of the famous people you've met, mm-hmm. you talked about m- meeting or fitting a player. Right. That's yeah. where we left off. Okay. Yeah. So I was fitting a guy named Brad Avery, um, guitarist for a band called third day, major Grammy winning Christian rock band. And I didn't know him. And I just knew he was a musician who was coming in and we're chatting. And it turns out that we were from similar areas in Southern Illinois. He's from Western Illinois. I'm from Southern. Um, And when I had left my high school band, he had replaced me. And so we're laughing about it. And he's like, yeah, yeah, I'm actually going up to Champaign. We're starting our tour next week in Champaign. 
and I swear to you, the words are coming out of my mouth. You're going to play at Mabel's. Mabel's is the club. That's where the my band played. That's that's just where you played. And it's it's coming out of my mouth. And he's like, oh, we had to add an extra date because we sold out the assembly hall the first day. And I'm like, like, like assembly hall. Is like they needed more money? Right. Yeah, like I'm like, oh, my God, you sold out the assembly hall. <laughs> right. Like, right? Take a break, bro. Yeah. <laughs> and... uh so I realized they were really something more than what a club band, um, right? And and Brad is an amazing human being. Um, he he left Third Day a few years ago. He still stays in touch with me. Sends me an email about once a month, checking on my health, checking on this, all this. Um, but you know, he would call me and he'd be like, "Hey, I'm in Palm Beach. Um, where's a good place to play?" And I'd be like, "Dude, I'm in Port St. Lucie." He's like, "Ah, oh, we're playing a show. Come down and." hang you know and did he play golf or yeah he, yeah yeah okay he, you know so he had some golf connection there he um he liked it yeah so mm-hmm. i've sent him some clubs and stuff and he um the funny thing is so on the mat system it it measured tempo right like backswing downswing mm-hmm. and nobody's been better i mean nobody's been more consistent than him and i'm like dude you make your living tapping your foot right yeah. like his musicians his think tempo be good. is off the chain and, uh, you know, we'd go, I mean, I, I hung with him on a lot of shows and if you've been backstage on a rock and roll show, going backstage on a Christian rock and roll show is a lot different. Like there less, is less, uh, hard drugs and it's not, yeah, alcohol. I mean, you're, you know, <laughs> but, um, no, Brad is, uh, one of the great people in the world. Um, and you know, it was really cool to, to kind of get close with somebody. I didn't realize he was who he was Mm -hmm. um we had a connection with golf and and he's been a big sport yeah so so tell the tell the story about going to the studio and oh yeah going to heaven yeah yeah yeah, right yeah going to heaven so yeah he um he called me one night and he's like hey i'm laying down tracks for our new album you want to come down well yeah you know i mean you're grammy so i go down there and ed o'brien is the producer who is massive super well known has done everybody um (laughs) And they're doing some guitar tracks, and they're laying it down. Ed's being cool talking to me, and, oh, we're going to change this thing, we're going to do this. And then he just looks at me, and he goes, you want to go to heaven? I'm like, God, I can't wait. So he pulls down. It's a, you know, an an attic stairway, right? Like you pull the little rope down, and the ladder comes down. And we walk up there, and it's just... Metaphorically, it's literally above oh, <laughs> It's like guitar cases, like, and he's pulling, okay, this is the one Dylan uses, and this is the only one Tom Petty's used to record these albums. And this is oh what Audio gosh. Slave recorded their albums on. And this is Bruce Springsteen's. And, oh my and I'm gosh. holding these guitars. Now, nah, this is a 58 gold top. And I'm going, like, these are the most valuable. Like, they're the tones that we've all heard, right? Like, and, and I'm just sitting there going, man, this is the coolest thing. Like, holding these things that, that legends have recorded their albums on. And he gets it. I mean, he knows it was a cool thing. He was, I mean, he asked me to go. I mean, and he's just pulling out the good ones, like opening this up and handing it to me. Oh, man, yeah, you know, and I'm going, man, like platinum records have been recorded. Oh, yeah, this is the only one he uses for this. And we played that into this amp, and this is how we get that tone. And had, it, had you ever talked to him about who his idols were like you had no. you, we talked about earlier no. uh, so that'd be uh, an interesting discussion so brad brad the guitarist he and i have talked a lot and he's a he's a van halen guy um but ed o'brien i mean i mean he's he's done everybody and very very unique engineer producer yeah. and didn't ask but he i mean he's done everybody he's done bob dylan he's done incubus he's Jeez. done audio slave you know How about that all right it was pretty legit no doubt. Any other like good stories about rock stars before we kind of get into yeah, your last yeah, yeah, phase yeah. of your career so, here? A couple funny rock star stories. <laughs> um, so um, I think it was we didn't we didn't go into the Doc McGee thing, right? No. Okay. So um, Doc and Scott McGee. So Doc is the guy who created Molly Crew, Skid Row, Bon Jovi. Mm-hmm. Um, so he and his brother run um, their management company. And Doc is legendary um, for what he did in the 80s. I mean, he produced everybody. He was manager. And so I started working with Scott. 
And uh, I think you mentioned him earlier. I might have mentioned Yeah, yeah but I don't so think you went into too much detail. Going over, That's yeah, fine. Can, no no big deal. Right. Yeah, no problem. And so they were like, you know, they're managing Kiss and Molly Crew. And yeah. my kids were young, right? Like seven or nine. And, you know, for me as a kid, like fourth grade, Kiss was just a, a thing. Like they were, oh, I'd draw the Kiss faces. I'd right. Put on my, and he's like, oh, your kids like it? I said, yeah. So. I get this box in the mail, and I mean, it's massive box, like massive, and it's from KISS headquarters. We open it up, and there's probably 100 t-shirts. Oh, my gosh. DVDs, guitar picks, um, you know, guitar straps, videos, head covers, anything you can imagine, you know, because they're a marketing genius, right? Wow. And... Um, so my kids start kind of watching the DVDs like the, it's, it, you know, it's a, it's a thing, right? Like, oh yeah, there's explosions. And so Kiss and Molly Crew are, are coming to town. And so they're like, Hey, look, if you want to come to the show, we'd love for you to bring your kids first show they've ever been to. So I call, um, call a kid who was like my best friend growing up, like in grade school days. And I was like, hey, man, he's a rocker, you know. I'm like, hey, you want to come down and see Kiss Molly Crew? He's like, yeah, man, I'll drive down, you know, cool, you know. And I'd take him, like, we we lost touch, and then we reconnected through Facebook like everybody does. And yeah. I'd take him to Augusta, um, and I'm like, hey, why don't you come down and check this out? We're going to go to the show. He's like, all right. So we go driving up, and we pull up to an area, and the guy's like, nah, this is no go. And I'm like, here, here's the code word or whatever so we pull in and we park next to um tommy lee's van bus right <laughs> my friend's looking at me like dude like what's going on <laughs> and uh so we get out and and they take us up and so the boys they'd given the boys like these you know those temporary tattoos that kids get yeah, yeah. so they'd given them that for like, but it's full, like yeah it's like face paint right and so they had nice. that on and scott comes and meets us he goes oh no 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 that's not gonna work so he takes the boys to Kiss's makeup artist, who does their faces, right? <laughs> oh, and we're on the bus with Doc and everything. And so we go, and um, my friend's just flipping, right? <laughs> yeah, like, right. So then we walk, and I mean, you can see there's the, sitting on my desk is a picture of the boys and Christian oh, with gosh. Kiss, yes. with them with the makeup. That's incredible. And then they're like, go on stage we're gonna get some pictures so the boys and I, we have pictures of the boys and i sitting on tommy lee's 360 drum set with the crowd behind us and then we're out in the crowd and my friend <laughs> looks at the kids and he's like dude this is your first concert and like yeah they're like yeah he's like it it doesn't always work this way <laughs> like this is not <laughs> this is not this normal. is not how it works <laughs> this yeah it's not so. normal um, another good one. So good for you. Uh, man. That's so cool to share that experience though with the kids. So uh, in our rehearsals building, you know, a lot of national acts there. We'd see national acts every night, and um, like Seven Dust recorded. Uh, they rehearsed next to us. Um, Collective Soul was just down the hall. So I saw um, Ed Roland a lot. Like we would see each other all the time. We'd hey hanging out. Hey, what's up? Have a beer, chill. And so I went to. Just to go to David Tom's party. Um, I've known David for a long time, and his charity event was at the club where I worked in Birmingham. Mm -hmm. And so I'd go over there, and so I'm over there one year, and, and Ed is playing, as well as the singer um, from, uh, God, it was that. If you could only see the way. You know that song? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Tonic. Tonic, yes. There we so, go. Yes. There you go. You got me singing. All right. Love it. Enough wine. That I wasn't bad. Hey. I saw Tonic live in Charlotte. So it amazing. Was it was him and Ed. And so, you know, we're in there taking a whiz. And Ed's like, ah, dude, what's going on, man? How do you know David? I'm like, oh, yeah, I know him. Blah, 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 whatever. Yeah. So two days later, I'm out at the club. And there's Ed. And I'm like, Ed, what's going on, man? He's like, dude, what are you doing? You playing in this thing? I'm like, no. He's like, what are you doing? Just hanging out. I'm like, I'm working. He's like, what do you mean? I'm like. I'm a golf pro. <laughs> like, this is my job. <laughs> He's like, what? Oh, my God, I'd trade lives with you. I'm like, yeah, let's fucking do it, right? <laughs> yeah, okay, exactly. you, you're a rock star. And he's yeah. like, yeah, you're probably right. And he's like, dude, I didn't know. I just see, every time I see, I see it at the studio. I see it at these things. I thought you were just, like, 
a guitar I'm, player, like a minor league musician, just hanging around, right? And I'm like, no, bro. I'm like, this is kind of my day job, <laughs> you know. And uh, it was awesome, man. But those guys love it, you know. Alice Cooper used to come out a lot, you know. A lot of those guys. And to me, I always loved, I always loved getting the <clears throat> guitar players and stuff like that because yeah. I could talk to them about shit that I was into, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, John Bell from um, Widespread Panic came out one day and he we were going to play and he's like I left my putter on the bus man he's like do you have a putter I can use I'm like yeah sure man I got a million so he's picking them up most people pick up a putter and they wave it around a little bit right like he's like hugging this thing <laughs> smelling it no that's not it man <laughs> I'm like dude Finally, he finds one. He's like, "Yeah, this is it, man." And and John actually went to UGA to play golf and what? quit like his first week so, yeah. to because widespread was taken. It's off. amazing how many guys that can actually play. It's, it's nuts, the best, right? Lost the passion, yeah, and like find something else. I'm trying and to so, think of like Stained is one of my favorite bands. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And what's the guy's name? Aaron. Yeah, um, he went country. On right, us. he did. Yeah, went into his acoustic thing and then lead went country, singer. Right. Like I was so <sighs> kind of disappointed, but yeah. like I didn't know if you yeah. had any interaction I, with those guys. No, I mean, that never was my did favorite band. So when I was in Birmingham, like the luckiest thing. So like a member that I taught owned a studio and he was the promoter for Alabama and he owned a club. Like and it was the club where bands like One Tear Down from Marinos would play. Right, mm -hmm. and so he's like. And it was three blocks from where I lived. He's like, I'm just, you're on a guest list. You plus one. And so it'd be like a Tuesday night. I'd be like, okay, so better than Ezra's plan. Okay, oh I'll go see them. Or, or, or Megadeth or whatever. And so they are the, the comp that's the place where Train, if you know the band Train. Yeah, absolutely. They got noticed from Birmingham. So they were hanging out in Birmingham. We were hanging out with those guys. Like their album hadn't come out. We were just sitting around partying with them just. After you know they're they're a local house band and partying they're like yeah man we're starting to get some airplay Atlanta's starting to pick us up I mean it's awesome and unbelievable <laughs> I'm gonna tell the story because <laughs> I promised I would never say it until my friend was dead okay but I'm gonna tell it honored to have okay. it on my podcast so my best friend loves better than Ezra loves him. He was supposed to come over because we were going to a concert. It was a festival and better than it was, it was playing. And my wife's friend was, quotes, dating the bassist, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, got it. So we're like, all right. So he blew me off, which was very common for him. He blew me off. And so then we were like, all right. Um, a tornado came through Birmingham. Crazy. So this festival's canceled. So we're back at our place. And I'm calling him. And I'm like, dude, you missed it because... Better Than Ezra is here in our loft. And out of the blue, the radio station is playing a live acoustic version by Better Than Ezra. So I just turn it up. And I'm like, listen, dude, he's just strumming my guitar. <laughs> this is him in my in my apartment. Yes. And he's like, ah, fuck, why didn't I come? Why didn't I come? And I'm like, yeah, bro, play this. And it's an unreleased song and all this. <laughs> I've never told him that was not true. That's, okay. This is the first time I've said publicly uh, that was not true. I was I just recording it. it off the stereo, but and he was so mad. And we got it. We it got so it. Mad, we yeah. got it on so, the record. Yeah, so. That's awesome. Yeah. So then, you know, I mean, to me that I mean, Rush, um, Rush, a big influence. They love to play golf, so they came and uh, played some golf with the Rush. They took us backstage. Never got to meet Neil. Um, mm -hmm. but you know, I mean, Alex just wants to talk golf and I'm wanting to talk guitars yeah, and I'm right. like, dude, tell me about this. And he's Isn't like, ah, so oh, dude, tell me about this golf club, man. Is this thing that go I'm like, ah, oh, yeah. So we always want what we don't have. That's you know? right. You know, but it's fun. It's so. yeah. It's, it, it's just so cool that you have that like alternate passion. I mean, like, it, do you have any regrets of like not making it no. in the music business? No, I, I, I wasn't good enough. It's just like playing Pro golf. Man. Really? I, I look at the I look at my friends who are, you know, the real deal. Yeah. Like I loved it for what it was. I mean, I love it. No, I don't have any regrets. I mean, I, how could I get any luckier than I am now? I know. Are you fucking kidding me? We're doing okay, dude. Aren't we? I'm doing a podcast with the man. 
<laughs> I mean, shit. I'm drinking some wine. Look, I got a bobblehead. My wife gave me a bobblehead. Are you kidding me? I, I, mean, I don't even have a bobblehead. I mean, well, there you go. We so, got to get the guru bobblehead. So, man. yeah, I mean, I've I've pretty much, you know, peaked out like <laughs> a long time ago, right? What's up, everyone? Guru back here again with a couple of things before you go. Uh, first, big thank you to Rob for coming on the show and sharing his story and incredible knowledge and golf instruction and also music i thought that was really really fun hope you enjoyed that and his insights on coaching for sure Uh, make sure you check out part two which should be dropping in the next week or so as it gets even more interesting as the wine continues to flow Uh, so more great stories and more great information for you coaches out there Uh, make sure you go to your app store and download the golf guru app and check out my information you can also follow me or reach me on twitter or the gram at golf guru tv give me a follow thanks so much for the love out there then also check out my website at golf guru tv.net where you can find videos articles and more information on my teaching and coaching if you have a question or comment just dm me that's the easiest way to get a hold of me Uh, music on this episode is by kevin mcleod and zach mullet and as i always leave with you study practice, teach, and then pass it on. I'll see you next time. Thanks so much for listening.